Right, so um, I'm hoping that everyone can see this. Yes, perfect. Everybody. Okay, right, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Rachel. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I was tasked with uh, covering, I guess, the practices used in health, uh, uh, health research uh, in the context of, health, uh, of data privacy. And um, so I'm basically, I've put together a whistle stop tour of some of the best practice or some of the most uh, techniques and methodologies that we use in the domain. Um, obviously, as a subject area, this could probably take up a whole day. And so, um, hang on, let me, let me close that. Um, obviously, it could take up a whole day. And so um, this is just a very brief overview. So, um, I, I was also asked to just make some comments uh, about uh, GDPR as well. And um, so this is basically where I'm going to start. So uh, the EU General Data Protection Regulation is fundamentally, it's a legal framework that gives us um, the guidelines around how we collect and process personal information. So that's personal data about people living within the European Union. And it basically tells us who can do what with the data. Uh, I was going to create an infographic about some of the key points of this <laughs> of GDPR, and then I actually found this um, this uh, graphic by Sage, which actually did a better job probably than I would do of uh, putting together the the, um, the an infographic. Um, but critically, GDPR is actually relevant for not just people within the EU that are processing personal information but it actually also is applicable to people outside of the EU that is also processing this information. And um, key differences between uh, it and previous uh, uh, data protection legislation is that in the previous uh, legislation, only the data controllers or the people that were hosting and um, essentially responsible for sharing these data sets were actually the ones that had to be compliant with it. Whereas now, uh, data users, which include probably most of us data processors, anyone that's using information uh, on individuals uh, in the, whether it's a customer database or whether it's a staff list in your department or whether it's you know, a health, healthcare records and things like that, we're all accountable and responsible, responsible for preventing the disclosure of that information. And we have to also have a responsibility to report whenever uh, disclosure is, is um, occurs and when there's breaches in, um, in this as well. Oops. Right. So um, basically, uh, this new legis well, this legislation gives individuals much more protection uh, than ever before for protection of their data. And this is because the rules around consent. Uh, have been tightened and so you can no longer just assume an auto consent uh, model so you can't just have a pre-ticked for example consent box uh, and critically we can all also withdraw our consent at any time and so uh, basically individuals in the EU now have the right to be removed from a data set they have the right to access their own data and they also have the right to know what happens to their data and how their data is being used. And so basically this is what um, sets, I guess, the context for the environment that we're working in. And basically what it means is that we have had to come up with uh, much stronger governance, data governance frameworks, uh, sort of maybe new or much more robust uh, privacy uh, protocols and infrastructures uh, and we're having to do things like, um, you know, contain very, uh, retain, sorry, very, um, very detailed data processing logs and also be transparent about the algorithms we're using uh, within our research, uh, within uh, being applied to these data sets as well. And so uh, what's the impact if you don't comply? Well, there can be fines, which uh, could be quite hefty. Um, but also, I guess, as a researcher, you potentially could also be sanctioned from having access to those data sets again, um, and but perhaps even uh, a restriction on, on funding as well. So um, the situation in the UK at the moment is that we are in 
this lovely Brexit transition period. And so uh, during this period, we have to comply with both GDPR and the UK Data Protection Act. And the Data Protection Act basically is um, our, uh, our, um, our, the UK legislation that brings us in line with GDPR, but is actually perhaps a slightly looser interpretation of GDPR. And it gives us a bit more flexibility uh, around what we can actually, um, how we can handle data. Um, personal data. For example, it gives us exemptions for patient care and also with respect to historical data sets as well. So all up to date information about this, because this is going to be changing um, probably over the next year or two, uh, can be is available from the Information Commissioner. And in a post Brexit world, I guess uh, our UK Data Protection Act will align with GDPR. But as I said, it's much looser than GDPR. And so what we're seeing is um, some companies are actually starting to move data sets that they have about individuals in the UK from uh, where they were once hosted within EU countries. Um, data sets about people in the UK are now being removed to, for example, the US. Um, because once we leave at the uh, end of the transition period, GDPR no longer applies to UK data sets. Um, so um, I thought I'd just give an overview of um, some of the mechanisms that we have in place within health research to um, basically address data privacy. And as I said, this each of these topics could probably take a whole, whole day. And so I'm just going to give pretty much a, a, a quick introduction to them. So underpinning, uh, underpinning all sort of uh, any working with health data uh, and in health research uh, is strong data governance. And basically data governance is the, is the policies and process, processes that ensure good data management, data usability and data security. And basically it's through data governance that we ensure our compliance with, for example, legislation like the UK Data Protection Act or GDPR. And that we're actually also addressing all of the ethical restrictions um, around the use of the data as well. For example, what has the data been consented uh, to be used for and can it, has it been consented for reuse outside of that? Um, and fundamentally, data governance protects, uh, is one of the measures to protect against data being misused and will also outline the channels by which you can report misuse and um, potentially the sanctions that would be applicable as well. So uh, probably the biggest or the most prolific technique used in health research with regards to the sharing and access and use of data sets is techniques such as anonymization. Um, and I guess uh, one of the things that makes anonymization and pseudonymization as well uh, so popular is that anonymized data, uh, GDPR does, is not applicable to it uh, once the data has been anonymized. And what do I mean by anonymized data? So anonymization is where you remove or redact all identifiable information from a data set. And then the next question, what is identifiable information? So it's any, any unique information that allows you to identify an individual. And so normally we think about this as being sort of your full name, full date of birth, you know, an address, but also um, it's applicable to IP addresses and email addresses as well, because these are also identifiable. And so I thought I'd give an example. Uh, so I have a piece of data here, which has someone's full name, the date of birth, their address and their status as a smoker. And so if we apply an, an anonymization technique to it and remove uh, identifiable information or partly redact identifiable information, we are left with this. So um, it's pretty obvious that um, the data set now is perhaps not as useful as the fully identifiable information. Um, and I have this quote here from a data privacy researcher, Paul Ohm, states that the data, data can either be useful or perfectly anonymous, but never both. And nothing is more apt than that. And this is probably why GDPR does not apply to anonymized data. But then as researchers, you can see 
um, actually that um, its usefulness is rather limited. So um, a technique that is used a lot uh, with health data sets uh, in order to be able to share and use them is pseudonymization. And uh, this is the process that essentially, instead of redacting information from your data set, identifiable information from your data set, what it does is replace identifiable information with non-identifiers. And these can be where, for example, here, um, the person's name has been replaced by a personal identification number or a reference number, um, the, uh, or, cat or, or a date of birth, for example, here has been replaced by categorical information, or just, yeah, categorical information, and location has been aggregated to a much larger area rather than providing an individual's address. And so straight away, you can see that this is far more useful to someone uh, that wishes to analyze it. Um, now, health data is not really used in, is rarely used in isolation. We normally link it to additional data sets about individuals, such as um, their uh, sort of like education attainment or um, perhaps financial information or sort of uh, socioeconomic factors as well lifestyle uh, conditions and, and such. And the reality is that once you start linking uh, an, either an anonymized or a pseudonymized data set with any other data set, um, with that increasing number of variables, you actually increase the risk of re-identification of those individuals. And uh, a very well-known example uh, that highlighted re-identification risk was in the 1990s when a PhD student, Latanya Sweeney, uh, who is now a professor in charge of the Data Privacy Lab at, lab at Harvard, uh, she re-identified the governor of Massachusetts by combining publicly available information about him with um, anonymized health records that she had authorized access to uh, for research. And she combined that information with identifiable information that she had paid to access from the elect electoral register that again was authorized access. And what you can see is that um, she was able to combine basically identify or she was able to uh, cross reference identifiable information uh, from this voter list with the anonymized data from the medical records and was able to identify the governor. And apparently she actually sent his office a copy of his own anonymized health record to prove that it could be done. Um, another example uh, from, um, from Sweeney is, again is an example where a um, public, publicly available news article reporting a road traffic accident um, was used in combination with again, authorized access to anonymized uh, hospital admissions data and again you can quite easily cross-reference information from this public article um, with this uh, anonymized record to actually identify the individual that that um, record belongs to. Uh, in this example the name has been changed to protect their privacy um, but once you have uh, their name you may have information for example about their personal health record number, and then you could actually go and pull up their entire health record. And so this is very, very highly personal information and really demonstrates um, the limitations of anonymization and pseudonymization as a tool to manage data privacy. So um, I thought I'd talk a bit about um, some other measures that we use in health research and um, probably the one that is most prolifically used in the UK as a mechanism to give researchers access to health data is data safe havens. And so a safe haven basically is a secure infrastructure that stores uh, this health information, this health records, um, but allows researchers to remotely access it and use that research data. So um, they can be, uh, safe havens can be at the small scale, for example, um, a university research project, or, or they can be much larger, perhaps at a national or even, uh, or a regional or even national scale. And obviously there are uh, benefits of uh, scaling up these sorts of infrastructures that come with that. Uh, they have strong security and governance standards. They are, um, for example, ISO 27001 um, certified. 
and they have a, a restriction to, to provide data only to usually approved used, pre, uh, used approved users or pre-approved users for, for larger data sets. Um, as the user, you would basically remotely access this through some sort of um, VM or client portal or something. And um, once you're logged onto it, you have the variety of standard softwares that you would use for um, typical statistical analysis, such as your Stata or R or, or something like that. And so you're free to work with the data within that environment. The data itself is usually anonymized or pseudonymized. Um, but also it can be linked to other data sets, um, but that even if it's linked data, it's held within that safe haven. And the critical thing for any user is they're not able to remove any data from that environment. So uh, one of the well known examples in the UK uh, that provides access to health data in this way is the sale data bank, which is run out of Swansea University. And it actually provides health data uh, for research purposes uh, on uh, the population of Wales. And as you can see, I mean, it includes, for example, primary care records. It also includes uh, hospital records, outpatient records, and a whole bunch of uh, medical texts um, as well. And to get access to this data, it's actually quite speedy. Uh, once you apply, if it's a sort of standard request, you can get access to this data within 12 weeks. And the types of analysis you can do um, are, you know, all the usual sort of epidemiological type analysis uh, that's common in the domain, but also more recently, they've opened up medical texts for um, natural language processing as well. Uh, and so this potentially could be an environment uh, where you can access quite a lot of data to, for example, train models on. Um, limitations of safe havens. So obviously they are quite uh, large infrastructures usually, and so they require substantial investment uh, to set up and maintain. They don't have any access to the outside world. So once you're logged into a safe haven, you don't have access, for example, to websites to look up information uh, from, from the safe haven. And so this could cause issues with if you have all your, for example, um, analysis scripts and things like GitHub, this, you can't just pull them in from there. You often have to follow some sort of um, up, a special upload process where your scripts are uploaded and um, most more than likely they are assessed by a, a human being to check that they're not trying to um, go against any of the terms and conditions of access. So one of the risks, because these are kind of like uh, sort of isolated, um, d um, I guess, data, um, data, uh, data statements, that there's a risk that the data is actually siloed, um, potentially at the regional, regional level um, or local level, uh, because it's very difficult to, for example, um, actually connect and sometimes it's impossible to actually connect in order to do analyses across different safe havens, for example. We've also shown that anonymization can only go so far with uh, preventing disclosure risk. And um, one of the things is that uh, the analysts using these environments actually can view all of the data. Um, and um, when data is linked, we've mentioned that it increases the re-identification risk, but also there's nothing to prevent people from taking, for example, screenshots of the data uh, to get, take essentially the data out of the environment. Um, obviously, these are managed by uh, users signing up to terms and conditions. And so if you are in breach of those terms of use of the safe haven, you might be sanctioned by uh, having your access revoked. So uh, I guess the top level uh, privacy measure in health research is secure data facilities. Um, I just wanted to show an example of one of these. Uh, basically, it is a locked down uh, secure room or secure pod. And this is an example from St Andrews University. And basically, it's a room that has a computer in it that allows you to analyze basically the most sensitive data. So this is typically identifiable healthcare data or really sensitive and confidential business, social, financial or economic data. So obviously, there's strong uh, governance processes uh, and you have to apply for use. Uh, the actual pods, the computers within the pods are not networked, so you can't access the internet, for example, you can only access a connection, a secure connection to the data set you want to look at, and no data itself is kept 
on the machine in this pod. You're pretty much only allowed in to one of these pods with the clothes that you are wearing. Uh, you are not able to take in anything else like uh, electronic devices, USB sticks. You can't even take pen and paper in. Basically, you are prohibited from ever taking that data out of that pod. Uh, often you are also video recorded for, to check that you're not um, uh, contravening any of the terms and conditions. And um, once you've completed your analysis on the computer, the results will undergo human scrutiny before you are given them back. So um, those are the sort of, I guess, the, the range of the uh, typical ways that we uh, address data privacy within health research. And I want to just spend a little bit of time on uh, this uh, notion of privacy by dental design analysis that kind of is complementary to all of these other methods that are used and can also incorporate sort of, um, statistical techniques and new technologies as well. Um, so I'm going to start with this quote by uh, the, the heads of medicines agency and European Medical Agency Joint Big Data Task Force, and they published their, uh, their report um, in December, so just a couple of months ago. And what they say is that investment in novel technological approaches for the management of patient level data which do not require the physical transfer of data, such as data shield, blockchain and homomorphic encryption, and which meet national and international data protection legislation are urgently required. Okay, so there's a real need, particularly within Europe, to have and bring these privacy by design analysis techniques uh, for application to medical research. So, uh, the example that I'm going to talk about is Data Shield because it's something I've been working on for over six years now. Um, it is an open source software and infrastructure that allows the remote analysis of data that can be held in one location or distributed across many locations. And the critical thing is that it has built in automated statistical disclosure control measures. Um, I'm just gonna, if anyone wants to find out more about uh, the infrastructure and, and kind of specifically how it works, uh, there is this paper here that I have cited and you can also download this presentation at this bit.ly link that is in the bottom corner uh, to look at later. Fundamentally, uh, Data Shield works uh, on a client server infrastructure and the analytic environment is R and what we've built is a series of R libraries that house client and server pairs of functions. So the user will uh, enact the function and that will then um, cause the uh, server side function to actually run and conduct the analysis. Um, the critical thing is that it works on horizontally partitioned data. So that's data where each uh, location has collected the same variables, but about different individuals. So for example, this could be a site in the UK, this could be the site in, the, in, um, in France, and this could be a site in Italy, and they're all collecting uh, for example, uh, cardiovascular measures. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of the methods in which we um, provide this automated statistical disclosure control, but um, if you want to find out more, you can actually go to our project wiki page about that. Um, the point is, is that to the user, it looks very familiar to them. It is fundamentally just R, really. Um, we, we just have these special uh, data shield libraries that provide these functions. And critically about the system, when you run analysis, the individual user can never actually see any of the individual level data. So they can't see any of the data. All they can do is run their analysis and get their results um, back in almost real time, just like R. So we can also do, other than statistical analyses and modeling in data shield, we can also do things like uh, preserving scatter plots, contour plots, and also uh, histograms to look at distributions. Um, we're currently working on expansion of data shield for application with to high volumeomics data and um, this is being led uh, the so the library is being uh, led by um, collaborators in Barcelona. So the challenge the real fundamental challenge of uh, this project is that we are an open source project and uh, more importantly we're academic open source project. Uh, and so it's very difficult uh, for us to achieve sustainability, but the Software Sustainability Institute over the years um, has actually helped us 
in many ways to, to grow our projects and um, gain critical mass really. Um, we've gone from just a small uh, one university team of researchers to a coordinating project team that's across the UK and France. And in terms of uh, software contributors, we have research groups um, across many, many countries in Europe and also in Canada that are developing extension infrastructure, that are developing uh, uh, new functionality to be applied to other data sets, such as the Zomix data set, and also groups that are evaluating the software as well. Um, so our community is slowly growing and we're supporting uh, some quite mega research consortia in Europe and Canada, uh, particularly around longitudinal um, life course studies. And um, I think that the reason, one of the reasons why the software is popular within Europe is because it does allow compliance with GDPR. So um, this is one of the great benefits of it. Um, as a project, as I said, we're limited um, by a couple of things which uh, are really because we are an open source project, which is that we're limited by funding sustainability and also by uh, how quickly our team, which is growing, uh, can actually write and test these and release the functions uh, required by our users. If anyone wants to join the cause, uh, or if you've got some interesting ideas about how perhaps Data Shield could be applied, perhaps in a domain outside of health research, um, I've worked with some other SSI, previous SSI fellows as well on uh, these sorts of things, uh, then please join our uh, forum uh, on discourse and introduce yourself. Um, so take home messages. I guess in health research uh, and, and also, you know, perhaps other subjects that are using uh, personal data, we really need to have uh, strong data governance systems that allow us to be compliant with all the necessary ethical and legal restrictions around the use of that data, those data. There is a tension between the legislative requirements, which kind of really address a bare minimum of what has to be done and addressing the real re-identification and disclosure risk around using these data. And I guess, uh, said from health uh, research, no one solution is perfect. And often what you'll find is people are using combinations of different methods um, that are suitable for their own and their users' requirements. And that is really a, a really important point. And I will just leave this quote here that I have um, added a few words to. It's a quote from a um, crypto cryptographer, which I think is quite apt now. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, we do have a, you have quite a few questions in the Google Docs, so um, okay. if you have time later, I might let you um, answer those, um, but we have time for a couple. So one question is, should we worry about companies moving UK data from the EU to the US? Um, so as I mentioned, um, our UK Data Protection Act is looser, so we don't have the same, we would once we you know, transition out of the EU, we don't have the same protections that European citizens do around their data. And so I guess um, this is why, uh, you know, some of these major tech companies have moved our data out because I suspect, well, I would imagine that perhaps there's more that can be done with our data um, after we come out of this transition period than currently, currently can be done. <laughs> or that... Um, that there's a less, there's a, I suppose, a, perhaps a, maybe not as strong requirement for them to be transparent with us about what they're doing with our data. Um, if people can reconstruct personal identities from anonymized data, how much more so can artificial intelligence do? Yeah, so this is quite an interesting thing because those examples that I gave um, from Latanya Sweeney, um, you know, they you know, were a couple of decades ago um, and technology has changed and I think that it's you know we can um, automate or certainly we can run we can create algorithms that can do this now for us and so um, I guess the way in health research the way that we protect against that is you know all researchers basically sign up to terms and conditions for using that data and you know at the end of the day 
your academic credibility is on the line, potentially funding, potentially access to other data sets that are funded by or, or, or that data set that you're using. And so I think um, certainly there's high ethical use of data from the academic community. I can't really comment about data use by those from outside of the academic community. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so I'll let you go ahead and take a look at those other questions in the notes and answer them um, when you have time. But let's all just thank um, Becca again. Thank that you. That was really amazing. Right. So.